Hello, everybody. So today is Tuesday, September 10th, and we are bringing you a special edition of Block Digest with Gabor Gerbex of Vanek. I hope I pronounced that name close to correctly. So, um, you know, before everybody else says hi, how, how are you doing today, Gabor? Uh, great. Uh, it's awesome. <laughs> We're just plugging through actually with a Bitcoin product. Uh, thank you guys for having me on. Should be a fun show. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, you know, I, I was kind of thinking, um, you know, we, we kind of lightly touched on uh, the, the news with Vanak in the last main episode of the Digest. And I just, I kind of thought like, you know, you've, you've followed me on Twitter for a little while and we've never really had a guest on from like the, the financial side of the things or like the, the legacy world. And so I thought like, hey, I'd reach out and see if you're interested. Yeah, thanks for the invite. It's kind of funny. Whenever I think about it, I work in the legacy part of the industry. It makes me sad in some ways, but hopefully on sort of on the more fun end of it. Uh, my training is in mathematics, uh, and uh, so I've been uh, involved a little bit in Bitcoin, and, and hopefully uh, <laughs> hopefully I won't disappoint from the legacy side. And, you know, we're, we're trying to work to bring to market some Bitcoin products. And uh, thank, thank you again for the invite. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, before we get into it, like what's what's going on with uh, you today, Rick Nopara? Oh, just a good Tuesday, man. It's good to, yeah, sit down with uh, Gabber here and actually talk some of this ETF legacy discussion because it is one of those things we talk about fairly regularly on the podcast and how the ETF denials kind of become a running joke at this point. And it's one of these things where it's just a... Uh, you know, one of these stories that we've just been talking and talking and talking about. So it'll be great to actually talk to some yourself and hear what your uh, perspective is there on the ground and how this whole prospect of these new products look. But uh, yeah, I'm doing good outside of that. Ready for the conversation. How about you, Nopara? You doing okay today? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious what I'm going to learn today. It's, it's uh, uncharted territory for me. Uh, on, on another side note, I'm also cautiously optimistic regarding my audio this time. I think I finally got it right, hopefully. <laughs> well, you sound fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I mean, like, uh, I guess let's let's just get into it. Uh, like you, your employer, Gabor, is pretty much like trying to build the, the fusion between Bitcoin and the legacy financial system. So I guess, you know just kind of open-ended to start like you know what what do you see as like the, the justification for that and how that's going to play out positively or negatively you know if these things actually get launched in the long term yeah definitely uh, i think maybe to start just so that the audience has an understanding why we're doing this here at vanek uh, uh vanek is uh is one of the older uh, financial services company. It was established in uh, 1955. The firm uh, right now manages about $50 billion. And uh, we have a history of uh, bringing to market uh, so forward-looking and sort of intelligently designed products that at the time are not that desirable. So we built the first World Equity Fund in the 60s and actually in the 50s, the first uh, international stock mutual fund and and you know at, at those times people thought that the firm is kind of weird and why are you doing this why are you investing outside of u.s equities and uh so we have done that with a bunch of other like gold for instance in the 60s uh, built some of the first emerging market funds uh, uh vietnam fund russia fund indonesia and and some some others that are sort of more uh targeted exposures and so um, we've worked with regulators on, on this very closely, uh, starting uh, with the 60s. And um, we wanted to do something similar with Bitcoin, given that uh, in some ways it's similar to gold. And, and, and we believe that Bitcoin has the potential to become uh, digital gold. And we should be you know, supporting that uh, movement. And while our sort of like skills uh, lie on the sort of the financialization structuring and, and the sort of like the regulatory negotiation side, uh, we wanted to do our part. So um, we teamed up with a, uh, with a company called Solidex who had the early uh, Bitcoin applications um, uh, competing with the Bunkelbus uh, brothers uh, for, for an ETF. And uh, 
together we made that application better uh, and sort of uh, tried to go for it. And then when we applied, uh, so this application combined is then for four and a half years. We're supporting it for about two and a half now. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of, uh, it's crazy that uh, in that period it wasn't approved. Uh, and we thought that would be an easier sort of uh, way forward and, and that there will be a, a Bitcoin ETF uh, in, in the market. But uh, we ended up running into issues like how do you price Bitcoin? Is the price of Bitcoin manipulated? How do you custody Bitcoin? And you know, while these terms are, you know, like custody of Bitcoin in the traditional sense is just kind of weird in itself. Uh, we needed to sort of find answers for it. And, and it ended up turning into uh, uh, sort of like a, a bigger discussion and, and it's, it's delays after delays. And, uh, uh, but we, we still think that there is a, a you know, good reason to bring to market a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, some of the institutions, the larger ones that we talk with, and these are the larger banks, pension funds, uh, hedge funds, uh, are interested in Bitcoin. They just need the appropriate plumbing that sort of bridges the uh, the financial uh, ecosystem and and Bitcoin. And so what we've done is just our you know the, our original ETF uh, design uh, is really just hold Bitcoin, hold physical and as physical as Bitcoin gets, yeah, just hold physical Bitcoin. And uh, no shorting, no futures, nothing. Just as simple as it gets. So. And then ensure that Bitcoin against hacks, theft, loss, abuses of any sort. Uh, and because we, we have seen that's a problem in this industry at this point. Uh, so we've done that and, and argued that, um, you know, such product would actually um, help protect uh, institutions against like big centralized like crypto exchanges that often may mismanage, mismanage or lose money. Uh, on their clients, sometimes they trade against their clients. So uh, basically, we, we thought that this would be a, a better way to um, to provide simple Bitcoin only exposures, no other tokens, just Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, so that got delayed. Um, some of the arguments were that the markets are still manipulated, you know, whatever that means. I think every market is manipulated in some ways. Uh, I argued many times with uh, the the SEC staff, CFTC commissioner levels too, that Bitcoin is not uniquely manipulated. We wrote a bunch of papers and kind of showing evidence of it that it's not unique. Uh, and then uh, there are sort of um, issues around how do you price these uh, Bitcoin? And then uh, one of our um, subsidiaries from Frankfurt, Germany, spent two years building indices to find the right institutional price of Bitcoin. So. We even went to a level where we now receive feeds from over-the-counter trading desks to to find institutional size uh, trades and price or instrument on it. So the, the the battle for an ETF continues, and it's it's not not sexy in any ways. Uh, we're just uh, we're doing sort of mundane things to convince regulators uh, that you know some that the right market structure components are in place, and those are custody pricing and manipulation protection. I think the market is ready. Regulators may not believe it so. So, um, so I guess that sort of we, we segued into this uh, offering just these 144A shares with uh, the Vanek and Sodex teams to qualified institutional buyers, which are just the biggest institutions. Because uh, retail investors, the everyday people, you guys and I could get uh, Bitcoin. You know, we could mine it, we could buy it, uh, we could trade it over the counter. But institutions do not have that flexibility legally. So we built this 144A product um, as as a bridge, and and hoping that uh, if and when the ETF gets approved, then those shares just will be um, pretty much. Uh, uh, translated into the ETF, if you will. And I'm, I know that this might be like, you know, what's an ETF and all those things. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer And because I don't know exactly what you know. Uh, Bitcoin has some of the smartest people, so uh, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if, you, if this is not if not new to you at all. But please ask if you have any questions around about this uh, so far. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, there, there is a, a couple <laughs> different uh, big picture directions I really want to plumb in there. But I, I think it would be a good idea, you know, just for a lot of the listeners to maybe real quick run down like the, the structure of an ETF and how uh, basket creation and redemption um, and that kind of stuff works. 
Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, for all intents and purposes, uh, and, and ETF is, is an exchange traded fund. It's like a mutual fund. It's like a mix of a mutual fund and, and a stock. So that means that it holds some underlying asset, uh, but trades real time on, uh, on an exchange and hence the name exchange traded fund. So what happens is, uh, in, in reality is that an issuer like VanEck or SolidX creates shares of this ETF say Bitcoin shares, and that the, then exchanges those shares uh, um, with, uh, with, co- with companies called authorized participants, which are sort of the largest inks and, and traders in the, in, in, in the world. And this exchange of shares, so, so ETF shares to underlying Bitcoin shares is, is what creates this me- arbitrage mechanism, which basically means that uh, there's always trading uh, from um, from the authorized participant side who just try to source Bitcoin efficiently uh, out in the market and just trade with the uh, with the, the exchange fund, exchange trade fund. But again, it's just a it's just a vehicle that trades in an exchange and holds an underlying. Traditionally, uh, ETFs hold multiple stocks. Uh, so like the S&P 500, for instance, uh, is uh, as an index and there's an ETF that tracks that. So uh, what happens is that uh, issuer would issue ETF shares and then uh, authorized participants or large traders would buy those 500 stocks in what's called a basket and they would exchange the basket shares to the ETF shares. Now this exchange is often what's called an in-kind exchange because the what the ETF represents and what the, the basket of, uh, of stocks or bonds or Bitcoin or commodities represent as is, is sort of is, is similar to the ETF share. So this is actually often a tax free transaction. So uh, that means uh, that this is often useful for, for investors that do not want to be taxed when they reinvest their dividends or when they exchange their shares. And, uh, and, and yeah, so, so I mean, an ETF, so that's, that's sort of an ETF. I don't know, maybe it's a long-winded answer for just an, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fund that trades on an exchange. One of the, the benefits of an uh, ETF is that uh, it is legally mandatory to, to disclose um, prices of that uh, ETF every 15 seconds. So you always know where it's traded. It's mandatory to provide transparency to the holdings uh, and, uh, it's uh, also uh, mandatory to enable uh, the investors to trade at what's called net asset value at the end of the day uh, for, for the fund. So this makes ETFs more desirable than hedge funds. Some hedge fund managers uh, disclose their holdings on a quarterly basis and you don't know what they hold, what they bought. An ETF must disclose what they have on their books legally and they're, you know, you're, you're liable for that. The other advantage is that um, you actually legally own the underlying of an ETF. Uh, and, and, and so that's, that's kind of important. It's not just a promise from your hedge fund manager. It's basically just better integrated. And what I, I like to say that uh, as far as Wall Street goes, this is sort of the most trust minimized structure that exists out there because like all the, uh, the authorized participants com- compete for order flow. Uh, the issuers have legal representations to make and, uh, if uh, you basically you, you try to this crazy trust cycle ends up being competitive. Uh, and I think that's works out for the interest of the in- investor. And just for, um, you know, as a, as a reference, uh, uh, 20 years ago, there were no ETFs. Uh, in the past 20 years, um, there uh, have been about 7.3 trillion, 7.4 trillion uh, dollars value created in exchange traded funds and uh, about 6,300, 6,000 actually 6,200 uh, ETFs uh, globally, uh, about 3,900 of which is in the United States. So it's, you know, some crazy assets have been created. Mutual funds are losing value to ETFs. The, the sort of the hedge fund business is uh, dying out um, because of ETFs, I would say, because there's more transparency in the space, it tends to be cheaper. And uh, I do think that, you know, Bitcoin and and sort of uh, more uh, trust minimized structures are the next evolution of, of the ETF. And that's kind of one of the other reasons why, why we're focused on it. Okay, so that, that last part, uh, I'm definitely going to try to get into later if we have the time. But so for, for anybody who still might be kind of blurry on what an ETF is, would you say like a very good 
layman analogy would be it's effectively just Bitcoin backed fiat notes that have a much better legal protection and transparency that people use to invest instead of spend his money. Yeah, that's a good way to summarize it. Uh, I, I, Except that again, the uh, the ownership is for the individual. Uh, it belongs to you. When you own a fund, like if there is an adverse event that the issuer goes down, then the proceeds go to you. So I think that's an important distinction. Now, not to be confused with exchange traded notes, uh, which are and there we have seen some uh, European Bitcoin based exchange traded notes, which whereby the issuer just promises you to pay. Uh, uh, proceeds mm -hmm. and you have a hundred percent counterparty risk here the fund is in your name and you own it the entire system needs to go down <laughs> to for you to or a large part of the system needs to go down for you for you to lose money and that's that's a different story mm -hmm. okay so it's kind of like circle back on um you know one of the things i wanted to touch on from your your first kind of breakdown of things is like etfs and like these kinds of institutional products are you know, very unpopular among a lot of Bitcoiners. And I think I'm kind of outside of the pack in, in that I really am, am looking at these things favorably and think they're necessary. So I, I kind of want to ask you, like, what you think about how I look at this. Like, if if the Bitcoin, like the hyper Bitcoinization thesis is correct, then in the long term, like, that's just going to suck up value from a lot of other sectors of the economy and that value transfer is going to wind up being very hurtful to anybody who doesn't have bitcoin and it's just not really practical to expect like everybody out there to take the steps and be capable of going and getting their hands on bitcoin that they hold themselves and products like an etf you know, you specifically mentioned like pension funds and hedge funds and other institutions looking at that. And I'm thinking like when you look at pensions and 401ks and things like that, if you give them a vehicle to expose themselves to Bitcoin, then all of those people out there who don't have the, the capability to, to get Bitcoin themselves have a way to get that exposure to, to protect themselves if like the, the, the thesis of hyper Bitcoinization winds up being true. And I, I think that that's a very like underanalyzed potential in, in the space. Ah oh, man, I think uh, I think we're having the, the network troubles again. Large, do not have a way to access. Oh. Sorry, Try this again. Uh, yeah, there you go. We so, can. Perfect. Uh, so, larger hedge funds, banks, and uh, pension funds and institutions do not currently have a way to access Bitcoin. Uh, primarily because those um, institutions have what's called a fiduciary duty uh, to you know, hold assets on behalf of others. So they actually can't make certain type of decisions to, to buy Bitcoin on crypto exchanges because of sort of like risk reasons, risk department reasons. It would just not pass their, their due diligence uh, modes. But if it's in the appropriate wrapper, then uh, like an e ETF or a you know, 144A fund, then these guys can access Bitcoin. And, and I do agree uh, with the thesis that regardless of whether Bitcoin, hyper Bitcoinization will fully happen or not, uh, the uh, one, one should be able to have the optionality to bet on it. And right now, all these institutions are excluded. Like we can, individuals can buy Bitcoin. Institutions simply cannot for legal reasons. So that, that is exactly why we're building uh, these products. And, and again, while it is you know, for, for individuals who are, are tax savvy and us, just uh, it's probably easier and better to hold your Bitcoins yourself. And you know, that's more Bitcoin native. It's probably safer for some people, perhaps not for institutions. So we are just helping to bridge that gap. And uh, eventually uh, I'm hoping that uh, exchange trade funds and sort of the next generation of them uh, will have Bitcoin like characteristics, better security, a little bit more ownership to the individual and some sort of uh, you know, delegated uh, voting rights in the form of hash power or something that, like that. But just maybe a later discussion 
what we are trying to um, do again is to provide access to to Bitcoin. And what people need is uh, transparency around ho on holdings, uh, prices, and appropriate liquidity. Uh, and you know, crypto exchanges don't have that. Uh, they also people just also need tax documents because uh, that's another, another underappreciated uh, aspect. That if those who want to pay their taxes do not know what to do with it. Like you just need to go to an Excel sheet and then spend like a month working through your trades or holdings and whatever. And so people fail to do that. ETFs actually uh, make that very easy. And uh, you know, we also think that you know, if, if bit hyper Bitcoinization happens, this Bitcoin could actually be a significant revenue for the state. Uh, if Bitcoin becomes uh, you know a few trillion dollar uh, asset class, which may you know, it is possible gold is an $8 trillion asset class, even if it, uh, I don't know, becomes 25% uh, of it, like $2 trillion, there could be, you know, the taxation uh, aspect on those trades and, and the sort of like the entire ecosystem it creates could maintain states. <laughs> so that's, that's why we are saying, well, let's build products around it. Let's not take this uh, Bitcoin uh, question lightly and, and, and try, you know, try bringing to market an instrument for for institutions first. And if it works out, then hopefully individuals who do not want to hold their keys uh, could buy it too. But I, I think right now um, regulators may not be fans of individuals getting involved, which is ironic because tens of millions of people already hold Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess I'm I'm just gonna kind of open uh, the, the floor to the rest of the crew to ask some uh, questions for a bit. Otherwise, I'm gonna <laughs> I think I'm gonna wind up being the only one asking you anything. Yes, so I have a security question, which I'm not sure you can answer, but uh, you are talking about transparency and transparency of holdings. Uh, so maybe you can that. Yeah. So, how 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 do you store your Bitcoin? See, are you using multi six hardware wallets? Uh, how do you generate your keys? Uh, is that the kind of question you can answer? <laughs> I'm sure. Actually, I can't talk about that. It's it's a process uh, that that is sort of like well known in the industry, but I cannot publicly go into that. Uh, it is uh, sort of the the most standard what you can think of we uh we're working with a cash custodian which is a large bank and and we do uh we do sort of uh, we have a a smart game theoretically designed process among multiple firms to generate uh keys as well as uh access uh the assets the interesting thing is and you guys know this better than i do when when you get transactions and uh and bitcoin and you don't need to access any sort of uh Wallets or anything like that, uh, but when you redeem assets, then you have to. But that, so that's the. We, we're hoping that you know this is. Uh, it, it's a it's a proprietary process right now, so I, I'm I'm sorry that I can't talk more about it. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, I have another question, but I will leave that for later if it doesn't come up. Uh, do you guys have questions? Well, yeah, like uh, you know, I can understand you know there's still being stuff where it's kind of like what can you. You know, you can't really talk about all that much because this process is still going through. But I'm curious if you can sort of just walk us through a little bit of what that process looks like as far as coming to what the measures should be. And like, are there actual discussions where you guys sit down with uh, regulators and try and figure out what they want? Or is it just kind of like a we try something, we see their pushback, we try something else? Like, is there... Are there really like uh, some discussions or is it kind of just you put out something and then see how they feel and then you uh, decide to, you know, adjust that to where it's something that seems more appropriate for them or or they're are they actually sitting down to talk to you like at some people from the SEC or with Van Eck to say like, hey, this is what we'd like. I love obviously if we had exact guidance, but we, so what I can say, we're, we're in touch with, uh, regulators that we work with pretty much all of them, SEC, CFTC, even regulators, indexing regulators, uh, on the, not daily, just, but weekly, bi-weekly basis or legal departments are, are, are in touch. And what, what happens is and this, is, this is Bitcoin is a sort of like a specific case. Like they, there's, there's questions around, um, again, the three major areas that they were asking questions around were uh, indexing, custody, and market manipulation, and uh, 
we're trying to sort of tease out <laughs> some guidance of what would be appropriate. But to be fair, actually, like you know, Bitcoiners and us from the financial side are experts. So we are recommending solutions to this space that the SEC and some of the bigger regulators do not know. So it's an iterative process. We go there with recommendations. Is this acceptable? Does this work? What do you think about the legal implications of this? And you know, we think, for instance, the price the price index that we built on the over-the-counter markets was one of the solutions, and that worked out. It took two years, two and a half years to build that. It was an iterative process with the regulators, with feedback, and and I, you know, I think that's one of the examples. Custody goes the same way, uh, and 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 it is so. Yeah, it is a more more of a discussion. Uh, there's open open lines of communication. They call us, we call them, we meet them in person, we present present documents and try to make it work. Uh, the uh, Obviously, I would love, again, uh, the, the administrative state just grew to be an enormous monster. So it's really hard to get things done. Uh, um, literally in anything today. <laughs> like the, uh, the first right. actively managed ETF just, uh, you know, took, something like 12 years to, to come to market. I mean, s- silly things like that. The r- rules around the, that, so the, the very simple rule that a financial advisor should act on the best interest of its customer just came to market after like 15 years of conversation. So <laughs> you know, that, 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 that's like the, the, these type of basic things just take time. Uh, so when you go up to uh, a regulator and say that, you know, there's this very interesting computer network that, that has like 10,000 plus, uh, you know, active nodes or really 100,000 on the, uh, if you count all of them, and then it creates money and I want to build an ETF on it. And by the way, it may challenge the US dollar. <laughs> 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 the, 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 the process is, is becoming a little bit uh, more difficult. But, but again, uh, it was the same thing with gold. Like it was at some point illegal to uh, hold gold uh, by yourself. And then we still, still ended up building a fund uh, in the 60s. And then, you yeah. know, so it's, again, it's iterative. Um, it's sometimes it's guessing, but we are, we are sort of, um, uh, unfortunately, so I'm, I'm personally, and, you know, this is, again, this is personally Gabor's view. I'm getting tired of the fact that we're putting out very good, you know, liquid, insured, industry standard kind of solutions. We're talking with all the Bitcoiners, all the firms, uh, all the legal firms, big institutions, and, and have great solutions that people could use and people want to invest in Bitcoin. And regulators just don't let these products compete. So what happens is substandard, weird, you know, exchanges that come to market and actually run away with people's money. And, and, and so um, I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, we're going to you know, see some progress. And that's why we sort of went on the route of, OK, we're going to do this 144A product. Ran, ran it by the regulators, it's a small step forward. Uh, it's not a full ETF, but uh, it, it gets the job done. And, and you know, it looks like this is the approach to go with. But I, I don't know. I, I, I'd love if regulators were a little bit more supportive. You know, this, this I think is uh, sorry, Rick, I, I, want, I want to jump in here. I think it's a good opportunity, but you know, th- this is something that's really been, you know, confusing for me personally. Looking at the SEC's recent responses to things, as far as like the accusations of market manipulation and overall liquidity, like you know, a few months ago, <clears throat> we we had that report from uh, Bitwise that actually analyzed the the trading volume on all the different exchanges in the platform and kind of like isolated those 10 major exchanges that actually show healthy price discovery and arbitrage between them and like isolated almost all the other exchanges in the space as just having like completely disconnected market activity like no indications of solid arbitrage between them and it's like the second that report came out, like I, I thought like this is going to completely change the SEC's attitude. Like they will see this market structure and realize that creating more regulated products to link in with those would be a way to strengthen that arbitrage and kind of bleed that regulation into it. Just because, you know, if, if there's enough of those markets being arbed between that are regulated, even if all of them aren't, that, that still has a, a major impact on the overall market. 
but it's like there's been no attitude change of that kind at all i've seen like they're still just singing the same song about market manipulation and prices and i like i'm kind of wondering like what do you think is really going on there as far as you know recognizing the reality of the market dynamics now, I honestly think that uh, some major governments, including the United States, might be fearful of Bitcoin sort of <laughs> become a global um, you know, store of value. And that challenges the position of the U.S. dollar. That might be the underlying sort of political dynamic. That, that's my personal best guess on the on the uh, sort of the exchanges in the report that that was published I, you know, I don't want to comment on any other companies work but the if you look through the in the exchange list and Binance is the first exchange in there with a 38 or 40 percent weight in an index now Binance is very 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 far from being a regulated or clean exchange or and again it's it's not they are trying their best but it's just you know regulated in some random country and it's not regulated in the U.S. and many of the exchanges on the list have that status. Even U.S. crypto, what we call exchanges, are not exchanges. They are trading platforms. They are state-registered money services businesses that technically have no responsibility to not trade against their clients and 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 some basic quotation things that do not exist. So they are not, you know, in the SEC's view, which I think is correct in this case, unfortunately, or at least partially correct. These things are just trading websites with a level to order book, and 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 that's that's the concern. So so that's why uh, actually we worked with uh, some of these over-the-counter desks that are regulated broker dealers who have, you know, some AMI KYC requirements, some quotation requirements, and record keeping requirements to build an index based on over-the-counter trading, where actually a lot of the trades take place. Um, if and it is you know the data that we we can't publish, but. Uh, if we, we looked at it and, 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 and uh, basically probably around 50, 60 percent of the trades that you see on platform also take place like over the counter. So a lot of the volume is over the counter. And, and our argument was that, yeah, the, the, this ecosystem is getting better. You know, the maybe some someday one of the exchanges becomes a broker dealer. Right now, zero of the crypto exchanges are actually broker dealers or trade out their broker dealers. It's simply <laughs> not profitable for them to be regulated. We have seen actually, you know, right now, like Gemini in the short term, for instance, uh, try to be a hyper regulated type of exchange and they advertise they spent a ton of money on it and volume dropped because uh, Bitcoin was just, you know, the, the type of institutions that would want to trade on those kind of exchanges are not in the game yet. So, that, I mean, that's my view on it. It's just the exchanges are not there yet and there's more work to do. And the kind of work uh, that needs to be done is actually not like it's it doesn't resonate very much with Bitcoiners because some of it is related to surveillance type of stuff, uh, transaction monitoring um, and so on. Though I would say and that you know some of these crypto exchanges are trying to uh, do the, do their best. Like the uh, my personal example is I spent uh, about nine months in Germany uh, trying to build some of these crypto indices with our Frankfurt office and. I needed a German bank account, and uh, I think it's actually easier uh, to open up a fully fledged German bank account than uh, a functional crypto exchange account where you can transact and, and send documents at size. Oh, sorry, it's not documents, send money at, uh, at, at size. So, um, <laughs> so you know, some of the allegations the uh, the regulators have that the crypto exchanges are you know manipulating stuff and they don't have proper AMI and KYC are also a little bit misguided. Things are getting better. And I think uh, as Bitcoins sort of, as there there's more institutional support, people realize that there's an in, like an opportunity to uh, to invest in Bitcoin and clean up the space and play the long-term game. And um, the you know best I can recommend is just, it would be great if the some of these centralized entities in crypto uh, would at least on the Bitcoin side be a little bit more open and or you know support some of the um, <laughs> you know ba ba basically register as a broker dealer that would make my life much easier. Well, I, I can see where where you're coming from on that side of things, trying to to get something like an ETF built, but it, it, the way like I, I look at this whole situation is just like you have on the one side. 
like extreme Bitcoiners who want nothing regulated, complete anarchy. And then you have institutional people who want everything regulated and structured exactly like the legacy system. And like the way I look at things is you can have both. If you know, the, the regulated like institutional side of things just kind of accepts that there's going to be platforms out there where those types of rules aren't being applied, but it won't matter if they're a small enough segment of the market and that arbitrage prevents like that lack of rules being used to manipulate the entire market. Yeah, and I, I, you know, honestly, this is how the FX markets work. Like one of the examples that I like to uh, bring out is, is from my uh, my home country, Hungary. It's a small nation which has the pretty much a very tight, like say, eighty percent for the sake of argument, more in the seventies control uh, of its cur- currency, the Hungarian forint. And uh, so, if Hungary uh, has specific rules around the tra- trading of the Hungarian forint, there's concentration on it. And so on. Should that should it be not possible for like a Chinese or American company to build an ETF or anything related to the Hungarian foreign or transact on it? No, that's BS. You know, it's just we we just need clean platforms and rules of engagement and let the free markets work things out. And some you you're absolutely right. You know, we that the uh... okay. So um, Shinobi, you're right uh, in that. Uh, Institutions prefer to uh, own Bitcoin in one way, in a regulated way, and there are some Bitcoiners who prefer to hold their own assets. Some people may want to uh, coin join their asset or uh, or do whatever with it. And I think that people should should be able to do whatever they want with their assets in the free market. And I don't see uh, why we should not have a Bitcoin ETF or anything in the market because there are multiple ways for using it. Cash is used in so many ways, and we've heard this argument a thousand times. So I, I just wanted to reinforce that I don't see any regulatory or money laundering or market manipulation issue that is uh, unique to Bitcoin. In fact, I think some of the transparency and oftentimes too much transparency is actually helping regulators to to get after people who want to use things for illicit purposes. But I just I don't think that the you know, subset of Bitcoiners are are sort of um, should be treated with extra caution, and actually, it's kind of unfair and 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 in some ways undemocratic to to um, to get you know, to to focus specifically on on Bitcoin uh, and single it out. Mm-hmm. You know, one one thing I I think actually like would be worth pointing out is, you know, people I think have this idea that an ETF would start and then just start sucking up all of the Bitcoin out there and just always pull in more Bitcoin and none would ever leave it. But like, it's like that completely doesn't understand the, the entire basket structure of an ETF and the fact that those are going to be created and redeemed and people will be trying to trade the arbitrage both ways and that that's not just like a, a black hole that Bitcoins fall into and never come out of. I mean, uh, this is actually my second question, but uh, y- you are arguing against it, but I, I-, I would say this actually makes some kind of sense if the ETF becomes so big that it becomes a systemic risk to Bitcoin. Uh, what do you think? Is that a possibility? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we see a large sort of my, my, my concern is actually some of the crypto exchanges who are arguably systemic risks already at the, at the size where they are at today. Uh, and when we you know, get to that point, I think we can we can do some steps to sort of uh, enhance the uh, ETFs with structures that enable um, sort of individuals to hold their keys or or, or sort of you know, chop up the assets or create different structures. Uh, in the financial world, uh, there is um, there are sort of uh, multi ten billion. Like we have um, a fund that is a multi like is over ten billion dollars in the gold side and and some. Someone the single billion dollar and uh, and they are you know they are not really a systemic risk and and you know at this point I think Bitcoin is fairly well distributed among everyday people 
And so if, you know, if a percent or 2% of the holdings would be uh, logged in into an ETF, so to speak, then, you know, so what? It actually belongs to a bunch of different people. Uh, then the task is to work very closely with, uh, with the, with the, People who sort of develop the space and 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 to to make sure that we protect those assets uh, and make sure that the, the assets uh, sort of uh, represents the interest of of the investors and so, so I you know I find that very interesting sort of an interesting directions where where, where ETF uh, ETFs can go down the line right now it's very simple I mean again the institutions simply can't buy into this revolution. And so we we'll literally, what we do is just provide a buy and hold uh, fund uh, to institutions so they can participate. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's Thank actually, you for you know, your answer. I, I was actually going to try and go into another topic before I brought this stuff up, but I think you, you just kind of sure. gave the perfect in, uh, Gabor. But like, you know, you exactly right talking about ways for people to have their own keys with something like this like the core like problem point most people are worried about is the custody well bitcoin is programmable money like we we have all of these constructs like a state chain or a channel factory or, or lightning channels like why couldn't you construct a, a smart contract based on those things that's just pre-signed transactions all coming from one output and every step along the way like that gets people to a point where they can claim like their share of some, a basket themselves or like the institution in control of it can claim it after a delay so that you, you don't wind up with people's shares being lost but like a, a basket instead of being bitcoin held in a vault uh, becomes literally a smart contract you're in and all of the financial services that were involved in the custody and everything before are just facilitating like getting into the smart contract now i think that's exactly the way to go and i'm, I'm hoping that you guys will help me with that so uh, down the down the line that that, that is the direction um uh, the obviously bitcoin is is in pretty much from almost every possible way is better than the fund structures uh that i see today and and most of the issues that, that are uh coming from the centralization or recentralization of the of the assets can be solved with sort of uh, on, 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 with higher layer solutions, uh, um, be it the state channels, side chains, or lightning network based stuff, or some, some type of uh, top layer smart contracting language that not uh, live today. Um, I think it's, it's all can be built on, on Bitcoin. And I think it would be a good problem to have because if there's an ETF with, you know, uh, say a few billion dollars of assets, then we are on our way towards hyper Bitcoinization. And I think that helps people to regain their confidence in money, which is, uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, again, I don't want to go in, in crazy tangents, but I think that's one of the biggest problems. That people lose faith in their hard earned money, the US dollar, the Euro, the Japanese yen, CNY, or really many other assets. Uh, and that needs to change. And we, unfortunately, we need to maneuver around it with these weird structuring type of uh, initiatives. But that's the way to there. That's kind of, I mean, <laughs> that's the only way to solve these type of uh, uh, problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something I think like people don't really think about too much just because it's, it's unpopular with uh, the fact that Ethereum is what really paved this road. But like you can build those same kind of constructs with any type of asset that you can tokenize. And e even if like there is still a, a total trust-based relationship uh, with somebody promising to redeem for some underlying equity, it still like takes all of the record keeping of that process and just makes it unbelievably like streamlined, efficient, auditable, and like, even though it's it's not as sexy as we're building like a political money, that's still something that could have a lot of efficiency gains created in just the financial markets in general.
Yeah, I, I agree. All right, well, Rick, Nopara, do you guys uh, have anything uh, to bring up before I guess I take us into the last topic that I, that I had I wanted to bring up today? No, I don't have now. Yeah, I think I'm kind of plumbed for questions right now. Is Janine around? Oh, yes, she is here. I'm around, but I don't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure we're all getting an opportunity here. All right, then, I guess off the diving board. So uh, I, I guess really the, the last thing I, I kind of wanted to talk to you about, Gabor, is, is just like the, the general attitude that you see among institutional investors towards this space. You know, like what, like what is, is their attitude? Is it just this is a thing that's important enough that I should own some, or is there like some kind of deeper, you know, philosophy or, or thought process behind the investments? Like is like how, how many of them are actual Bitcoiners versus like, just, I should own a little bit of this because it seems to be making money. So there, there are two, two groups. Uh, one of them is sort of the um, hard money, somewhat Austrian, often gold owner group who who understands the the implications of Bitcoin and sort of even under, even without understanding the full sort of like technical specifications that, that went into build, constructing the network and, and, and how it came around, they, they get the investment uh, idea and want to be sort of allocating some percent of their assets probably somewhere between uh, half a percent to three percent in a, in, a, in a diversified portfolio to Bitcoin. So that's one group. Those are looking. Those people are focusing on Bitcoin, not other stuff, just Bitcoin and see see how it goes. So their exposure to the digital asset space is through Bitcoin. And there's another. So this is a very small percent percentage of people. And, and I have to be honest, I think it's probably, you know, probably five percent of people, 10 percent, maybe. Uh, uh, but the rest, there's a there's a big group of banks and and sort of systematically important institutions that actually want to kill Bitcoin and they still wish Bitcoin to be away, and that's it's a really really influential group of people who just don't want their jobs and life to to be changed. So uh, we should be aware of them, and that's why sort of uh, what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that Bitcoin gets into their, you know, life, everyday life and way in which they, they live their lives and, and so that they can get access to this, you know, unique asset. Because uh, right now, they, you know, this 80, 90 percent group is viewing Bitcoin as a big disruptor to their jobs. But one way to get, you know, familiarize them with the space is to find a convenient, relatively familiar way to, you um, to have have them access the ask class, so that's what we're trying to do, and I, I think uh, it's underestimated how big that group of people is. Like some traders are unwilling to clear Bitcoin. Large bank that has tens of millions of clients are not able to will not wire money uh, to to a crypto exchange and things like that. These like micro censorship forms that. Uh, are actually very pervasive. So, so again, those are the, the two groups. One of them who are sort of gold bugs or sound money people to to start with, or uh, and maybe a little bit of those like, oh, this is cool tech. I'm gonna put a little bit of you know, venture allocation into it. And then the other side, which are the lar large banks, is like, well, unless I can participate in it in a way that I like it, I wish this to go away. <laughs> so I'm trying to get that big portion of. Uh, um, institutional investors to kind of calm down and 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 give the appropriate attention to this asset and don't just treat you know young people in this space like they are children and don't know what to do but just evaluate Bitcoin as what it is which is an exponential technology that will change the financial lives of many people so that's kind of the um, again that's the group that I'm trying to focus on and and it's it, it's hard. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, as far as, like, you know, the, the other side of things in this space, like, you, you mentioned when, when we first started, you know, pension funds and, and things like that kind of looking into Bitcoin as an investment vehicle. And, you know, we've seen, um, I th it, it was either early this year or late last year. Um, I'm kind of spacing on the exact time frame, but the major universities like MIT, Stanford, Harvard, 
um, all allocated small percentages of their endowment funds into um, Bitcoin. And so, like, you know, are, are you seeing any kind of, you know, interest in, in those kinds of areas, you know, that, that people might not expect? You know, like, what, what's the attitude from, like, that kind of segment of things and, like, how they're and, like, how they're yeah, th there is interest. Again, the, the vehicles that they are forced to invest in are sort of hedge funds or limited partnerships that don't show your assets for like a quarter and there's no transparency into it. So I think there's a lot of pent up demand that is waiting for sort of like a transparent, daily tradable, liquid insured exchange traded fund. And that's kind of why we are going for, for, for that. I think once the, once the structure, the right structure is in place, and regulators give at least some level of approval, they're going to be ready to invest in this asset class. Uh, as, a, as a frame of reference, uh, just to, to think about this, how, where, how does how Bitcoin could play out? Uh, gold is a good example. So gold is right now around $8 trillion of uh, outstanding assets or, or, or market value. Uh, and about 0.7% um, uh, uh, of uh, managed portfolios in the world own hard assets like gold, oil, um, metals of all sorts, 0.3% of which own gold. So it's all portfolios in the world, only 0.3% of them own gold uh, in, in a financial instrument, yet it's still uh, $8 trillion. So Bitcoin can actually get to a very significant level if only like half of like half a percent of portfolios owned a chunk in their uh, in their in their asset allocation. And by the way, most of these asset allocations are sub one percent to gold. So you know, half a percent of a less than one percent has half a percent of all portfolios with less than one percent weight could you know be significant. So don't you know? Again, we don't need to sell the entire world on Bitcoin. It's just uh, the the institutions who sort of already own gold or or are some sort of safe haven assets uh, could could make this all work. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I answered your question right, but uh, it's kind of this point I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, you did. It's actually you know. And talking to you, I it's, it's I'm feeling a lot more positive about this space because it's like all all of the things as a more technical person in this space that like they're the things that pop into my head or like how I would think about like these kinds of institutional things. Like it seems like that's exactly how you're thinking. And it, it's like I feel very positive that the, the people in your position actually have a very good grasp of all of this shit some some do some don't it's you know it's learning and it's bitcoiners to, to to teach other people and and speak the language that most people do speak and actually that 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 that's the most helpful thing that could happen is just you know teach someone else <laughs> about very basic bitcoin and not just randomly on twitter that i tried to do we all tried to do but you know, go to that institution, uh, talk with the board, and I, and I spend a lot of my time doing that, going to that you know, select list of the 50 largest institutions and, and tell them about Bitcoin and, and how this could work and how they should be part of it. So, and they are, you know, I, I share the sentiment with you, Shinobi, that they are, uh, they are open to it. Again, it just needs sort of education and and, and sort of uh, more mathematical than a programmer person, but they also need a product that works easily for them and, and, and checks all the boxes. So, I mean, as, as UI gets a little bit better, as there's sort of like uh, you know, canned products out there where you don't have to paste addresses, you know, maybe CoinJoin would be automatic or maybe it's, things would be private by... Uh, definition or, or things like that. You know, the purchase of Bitcoin would be automatic every week, every two weeks. If those tools become available, I, I think uh, that could supercharge adoption for the for the larger institutions too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really like this is just you know I I think like people who who look at Bitcoin and see hyper Bitcoinization coming. Like they, they completely invert 
like the the reality in their heads. Like they they look at it like forget all of this institutional money and big money and like let get get people on the streets using it, and that just completely ignores the the reality of, of supply and demand in a market. Like you're not, it's not all the moms and pas on the street that are going to take Bitcoin to a multi trillion dollar asset class that's capitalized enough to use as money. It's going to be all of the big money where that wealth is concentrated and it's like you know a lot of people they don't like these institutions they don't like this big money but it's like that is an absolutely necessary part for this thesis to actually be fulfilled yeah and and they are again um i think it's sort of more more of a Combination. So, what is an institution? An institution just represents a bunch of a collection of or set of everyday people. So, uh, in some ways, when a large institution with, with billions of dollars in assets comes comes into this place, then all their clients, sometimes millions of people, participate uh, implicitly, and you know, newsletters go out to. Uh, to teach the the clients of that institution and that's that's how adoption uh, works it's just uh and as uh, it's kind of like basic organizational on it takes longer for institutions to to find a common denominator that they can push through all all of their clientele um but yeah i mean th there's the actually i on on this matter too i, I wanted to ask you guys is is there anything that we could do better or like how how else i mean we're trying our best and we have dedicated resources and, and, and things like that and trying to invest it, um, a lot of time and money trying to get this ETF to market and, and other things and trying to be available when needed. But is there anything else that we could do better or how, how else can we help? I mean, like, honestly, like, I think you guys are doing a great job, like, as is. Like, you're showing a very good understanding of things. You're doing what you have to do to accomplish the goal you set. I mean, it's just, I think like Bitcoiners who are going to be rapidly against ETFs and institutional products, they're just always, the, the, that's just blind ideology instead of somebody actually sitting down and looking at the situation. Yeah, it's really hard to say like if there's anything else more you guys can do because you guys really are doing a lot and from, you know, all these different people and groups that are trying to put these products together, like you're saying, I mean, there's a lot of education, there's not really any infrastructure there yet as far as, you know, the networks and people that have these firm understandings of how this stuff works. So, I mean, it's really hard to say other than, you know, you guys are, you're moving forward. It looks like things are about to go through with you guys with this uh, 144A and we know that these other contracts are coming out later this month. And I mean, you know, there's just all these people that are coming in to bring these on ramps. And I know that, yeah, there is this conflict with, uh, you know, the bit, some Bitcoiners about how exactly it all gets put together. But, you know, there is no road that you guys you are building the road as you go forward. So it's hard to say if there's anything really I could say this, how to do it differently. You guys are doing it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, we were, we were trying and we are always open to feedback. You know, it's like down the line if uh, a specific you know, opportunity comes up about indiv individual ownership or something like that, uh, we are definitely a firm that can listen and uh, I'll, I'll do my very best so that, that the feedback that we are getting <laughs> is actually gets listened to. So, uh, yeah. I guess that would be the only thing would be like what Nopar brought up earlier as far as uh, security and just like uh, how big the pro like how big the pools get of a uh, of Bitcoin there and what all that can mean for the network. I'm sure though you guys think about that as like that is part of Bitcoin's value proposition to make sure this thing stays decentralized. So I'm sure y'all are working on that as well. It's not like uh, I imagine y'all are taking that into account. Short answer, yes. All right. All righty then. I guess uh, you know that that kind of really got us deep into everything I wanted to get into. I mean, unless anybody else has something to bring up or something they want to ask a boy. Oh, we had a bunch of good questions from the chat. They're trolls. Ignore them. <laughs> well, well then, guess, yeah. Um, 
I, I guess you know our, our buddy uh, Satwale. He's kind of from the, the financial world. He, he's asking, you know, are there any kind of other uh, registered products that could be fast tracked quicker than an ETF? So I, I personally don't see um, uh, there are some efforts uh, to do like exchange traded notes and exchange traded commodities. It's not the same. We would like to provide as direct uh, as possible long only ownership to Bitcoin. So um, I, I would say no. Uh, yeah, not not at this point. Oh, sorry. One, one more one more thing. The the one forty four is actually live. So hope hoping that uh, it's really live from last week technically, but the. Uh, Sort of like the creation uh, redemption mechanism, and it really starts this week. So that is a live product, and actually, you know, again, it's for qualified institutional buyers only. If any any large institutions globally wanted to buy it, it's open. Uh, so we are. I'm, I'm hoping that helps with adoption. It's not a full ETF. We 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 call this the sort of a BTF, a broker traded fund, because it's sort of qu qualified institutional buyer to qualified institutional buyer. But that's that's on the market already, and and that sort of uh, has daily liquidity. It's not a hedge fund. Uh, we'll we'll try to provide more transparency around it too. Uh, I just we were so down in the weeds with structuring, getting the basics done for this new structure that uh, we didn't just have time to do write ups and proper press stuff. That a lot of the companies it seems like they're spending a lot of time on press, but uh, we'll try to do better uh, on that. Mm hmm. All right, so um, I guess you know. Thanks a lot for for coming on, Gabor. This has been a really interesting talk. Um, and I guess did do you have any like last thoughts or anything uh, you want to say to everybody before we call it quits? Uh, the only thing I would say is that uh, you know this is a long. I, I think about this as a multi-decade relationship, like between Bitcoiners and and institutions. And uh, if I can be of help in any ways do do not be shy reach out to me on your know, twitter linkedin uh, any reddit or any any chat rooms that I, i'm on uh and we're we're open and i'm you know happy to help in any ways uh, we can or i can mm -hmm. all right well you know thanks again for coming on Gabor. Uh, i hope everybody listening uh found this educational and uh interesting and i guess we will see you guys soon for a regular episode adios later everyone see you stoke see you stoke <laughs> mm -hmm.